You're watching the Wellness Hour, news that makes you healthier. I'm Randy Alvarez. Today is a special edition of the Wellness Hour. My first guest, and we're talking about pain management, but this is lecture style. This is a more sophisticated, it's not our typical type of an interview. Today, we are literally going to hear from a world expert on the topic of pain management and reversing pain. Uh, with us, we have Dr. Lax Manchikanti. He's a physician specializing in interventional pain management. He's a professor, a philanthropist, and author. He is co-director and founder of Pain Management Centers of America with 14 clinics across multiple states. He's the founder and the chairman of the board of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, the Society of Interventional Pain Management Surgery Centers, he also founded the American Board of Interventional Pain Physicians and two medical journals, Pain Physician and Pain Medicine Case Reports. Dr. Manchikanti is credited with advancing the evolution and development of interventional pain management as a specialty in multiple ways. Interventional pain management is now recognized as a subspecialty with representation on Medicare programs. Dr. Manchikanti serves as clinical professor at the University of Louisville and LSU Health Sciences Center in Shreveport. Academically, he has published more than 600 articles and 12 books related to interventional pain management and regenerative medicine. Dr. Manchikanti graduated from Gandhi Medical College, Hybridad, and completed his anesthesia residency of at Northwest Ohio School of Medicine at Allegheny General Hospital and the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He is board certified in pain medicine by multiple boards and competency certified in regenerative medicine. Dr. Manchikanti, welcome to the program. Thank you, Randy. Now, today is a little bit different type of a program. You're going to show a slide deck and discuss all types of chronic pain and kind of what you do. Uh, so before you start the slide, what are we going to be looking at? And what's your goal with this slide deck? Who should watch this, this uh, meeting we're doing right now? Uh, everybody can watch. And actually, it will be helpful to understand and it mean doctors can watch and patients and patients' family members, they can understand how to take care of their family and help them to understand the various issues related to pain, how it comes. And also, I'm going to talk about medication management too. So t let's, let's go to your slide presentation and I'm actually going to sit and listen. I'm gonna try not to ask a lot of questions and interrupt. So Dr. Manchikanti, over to you. Thank you, Randy, again. Uh, we are going to talk in simple terms so that everybody can understand with some pictures and uh, cartoons, as you say, about understanding and managing chronic pain. So here we go. I show you a picture of a pain patient who has overwhelming pain, and you can see how they are suffering. Then we are always worried about pain, physical or psychological or both. So we, I prepared a slide to show you pain is always biopsychosocial model. In this thing, you see not just the pain itself, but biological factors, psychosocial factors, and social factors. So pain is here. The, it is coming from a biological factor. That is the disease severity, nociception, inflammation, or brain function. From there, then you see the influence of psychological factors, mood, fear, stress, coping skills. Then we go into social factors, your social support, economic factors, so many other things affect. So together, pain becomes a major issue. It is so much so that federal government is looking into it so carefully and have advanced so much money and so many studies they appointed Pain Management Best Practices Advisory Committee. This was done by Vanilla Singh, who is an ASIP member. That shows interventional procedures. That is what we are talking about today, about our procedures, what we offer. As you said earlier, earlier you do these procedures, better off you are, longer term relief, same way with, like many other treatments. So, but after you had surgery, in, Unfortunately, if you fail to have surgery done, the significant relief, then again, it is the best thing to do. 
Then we also have a lot of other options. We can be involved in medication, restorative therapies, and even complementary therapies. In the past, chronic pain was not able to be diagnosed specifically. That was our goal. At that time, when we couldn't diagnose the pain, we always said it was psychological. But current trends are different. We find the source of the chronic pain by what is called a precision diagnostic injections. And then we want to eliminate the pain or modulate the pain generators so you will have better quality of life. To understand the chronic pain, I just want to give you a little bit of information here. All right. It's called a nociception, pain, modulation. So nociception is physical transmission of pain impulses where it starts from your foot or hand and how it goes into the brain and comes back and you feel the pain. Acute pain is, it is just an experience of actual damage or you think something is going to happen harmful. Chronic pain, this is a pain which persists beyond the usual course of an acute disease or after a reasonable time for that to heal and it doesn't happen, this period can be anywhere from three to six months. So just to show you an example for acute pain, so somebody stops your toe here or the foot and the impulse is going into the spinal cord. From there, it goes up into the head. So there are different things. We were talking about the modulation. What is modulation? So here you go, the impulse is coming and it goes into the brain. Thalamus is the brain. From there on, it comes back and it keeps increasing in the size. So this is what modulation is. Pain is modulated. Now that small area was the painful. Now it has become a larger area. It also causes what is called allodynia, where a non-painful stimulus, which is not usually painful, can be painful, like just a touch. Hyperalgesia, that means hypersensitivity. So these are the issues with the modulation. Usually, what do we do when you have the pain? Get an MRI or a CT scan. What do these things tell us? They visualize the anatomy. They show us what is wrong with the piece of the structure, but they don't show how the pain is, where the pain is. So it can't measure the pain. So it, one good thing it does is, if it matches with your pain patterns, it can identify a lesion which can be surgically correctable. Let us say if there is an operation you can do on it, you can do it. These are abnormal a lot of times, MRI and CT in normal patients, normal people like you and I. So for example, in 1994, this landmark Mark article was published. In this, they showed MRI was MRI showed that there was disc bulging in 52% of the patients and disc protrusion was there in 30% of the patients. These, these people never had any back pain and don't have any back pain. So just because it is abnormal, you can't jump into something major unless it matches with your symptoms and problems. So diagnostic injections are, we put small amounts of numbing medication into the area where your pain is coming from under the x-ray guidance. So with that, if your pain relief comes, then we consider that as a pain generator. Therapeutic procedure for treatment purposes, that was diagnostic. So for treatment, so this will help us to relieve the pain and reverse the symptoms. It also gives time for healing. It facilitates exercise program, rehabilitation. It makes you better. You mix with your family. You start doing social activities. It also reduces the need for imaging or surgery. So when we look at spinal anatomy, there are three regions in the spine, or you can consider as four or five regions. One is the neck region, it's called cervical spine. There are eight segments in there, eight vertebral bodies. And then you go into the thoracic spine, there are 12 of them. When you go to lumbar spine, there are five. After that, you have the sacral spine, which is about five. Then you have the tailbone. So these are all the spine. Everywhere there is a nerve. 
Now, when you look at the pain, pain can be coming from nerves, but also it can come from just the bone, ligament, joint, muscle, disc. So these are all the types of pains. There is somatic pain and referred pain. Referred pain means you have a problem here, just under your diaphragm, and it goes into the spinal cord area, and there is shoulder blade area pain. And both of them go into the brain area, and then you feel the pain. So it can be duplicative, that is called refer referred pain. Sometimes your source of pain is at a different location, and you are feeling the pain in a different location. The disc is the most important thing. We all talk about the discs, uh, my disc herniated, my disc ruptured, so on and so forth. So they are present in entire spine, as we have seen just a few seconds ago. There are two parts to the disc. One is the annulus, other one is a nucleus. It is like a jelly donut. So nucleus is the jelly part, annulus is the other part. So this can be a source of pain one by disc herniation or disc bulging, extrusion, but also it can be normal as any other thing, but it can still cause the pain because it leaks the substances and irritates them. So Dr. Manchikanti, when you're talking about the disc in the spine, so when you have a bulging disc, it hits a nerve and oftentimes that's the source of the pain. Is that correct? And then the second thing you were talking about is the disc can leak like fluid, I, is, I'm trying to understand this, leak out fluid that can also cause pain, and maybe that drips into the body or drips onto nerves, et cetera. Uh, is that kind of what's that, happening? Yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, now, as I'm showing on the next uh, slide here, the disc bulging can be different things. So this is called a symmetrical disc bulge. If you take, this is the disc area, whole circle, and the bulging is all around. This type of disc doesn't hit the nerves, uh, unusual, but it can sometimes. Whereas this one, the second one, broad-based protrusion or herniation, so it has the disc protrusion into this area, smaller area covering it. So this can hit the nerves. And this one is even worse, the focal protrusion, this is the worst one here. Why is it the worst the one? But the disc herniation, because it is on a smaller area, so it focuses on hitting the nerve, causing mechanical pressure, more pressure, so focused pressure. So the next one is actually disc extrusion. Here, the disc comes out so much so that if you just work hard at it or it stays for a while, it can even disconnect from the disc itself. It becomes a piece outside. So it is an extrusion, that is what they call disc extrusion. So disc protrusion or herniation, these are the more common conditions where we see. This is a good condition for surgery. If interventional pain management doesn't work or other treatments don't, surgery is a good option here. The patients do very well with this. Disc extrusion is definitely you need a surgery. But these other conditions, they are better off with interventional pain management and try to get them without surgery. This one is 50-50. If they improve, that's fine. If they don't, they can try the surgical intervention. So this is how you look it on MRI that the disc shows up. Look at, it is dry, this water content is low and disc is coming out. So this white stuff is the water and here water is less. So this part is also disc extrusion. So when we talk about disc leaking or pressing on the nerve, we are looking at irritation or inflammation. That is the chemical soup I was talking about. That is called radicular pain. And a little bit progress there, it is called radiculopathy where their patient will have numbness, weakness, and sometimes you lose the reflexes in the knees and ankles. And sometimes they don't even have pain with radiculopathy. So this is how it looks. Imagine if you are, if somebody comes up with this picture here saying that my pain starts here and goes down into the arm, the same thing on this side. And here it is, we can identify the levels of the pain, where it is coming from. The same thing goes for the low back. This is L4, this is L5, this is S1. 
Now I will show you the disc, how it works. So this is the disc part. This is the vertebral body. This is the nerve root. And here is the jelly part. This is the annulus and that is the jelly. See how it is leaking and it is coming out. And it can be herniation or just the leaking of the substances, irritation. So why does it irritate? How do you get the chemical soup? Here, these are the substances, phospholipase A, prostaglandin, and other polypeptides. These are the soup. They irritate the nerve, and that is how they result in pain. That goes into the spinal cord and brain. The spinal joints are also important. It's not the just the disc, but there are joints. So spine is a three-joint complex. Two facet joints on each side, and then the disc in between with vertebral bodies. Sacroiliac joint is the joint which connects your hip, a joint area with the low back. So again, I'm going to show you some pictures here with the low back pain. This is the low back. This is the disc. This is the vertebral body. And here is the facet joint. So this joint is present at everywhere. This can cause problems. So how does this type of pain look like? We saw yeah. how the radicular pain looked. So in this pain, the primary pain area in the low back is your low back and just the hips. And it can go into the other areas some. And extremely rarely, it can go down more. If you have mid-back facet joints involved, this is how the pain is. If you have the neck joints, this is how these are. SI joints, that is the sacroiliac joint, and a lot of people put their finger on there and say, this is where I'm hurting, the sacroiliac joint right there. And this is how the pain pattern looks. So what do we do? We have kind of an algorithmic approach, how to approach these things. So we identify whether it is a somatic pain or radicular pain. By this time, you all know how to do that. So it is facet joint pain. If it is the, then we treat them with medial branch blocks, injections, or we can he put the heat on the nerves. It's called radio frequency. Some call it radio wave treatment. Sacroiliac joint, it's the same thing. We can inject or do the radio frequency, or we can even do the fusion. Discogenic pain, there are intradiscal therapy treatments. If it is radicular pain, this is where we do the epidural injections, percutaneous adhesiolysis, endoscopic decompression. If it is stenosis, we can put spacers or we can do a mild procedure. Above all, the final stage is the spinal cord stimulation or implantable infusion systems. Dr. Manchikanti, let me ask you, everything we're talking about, just about everything you're talking about, these are very low downtime procedures. Is that correct? And the other thing I wanted to ask you is, do they usually feel pain relief right away? And then I'll let you continue. I'm, thanks. Yes, sir. They, they do feel uh, pain relief immediately. They're all outpatient procedures. Until now, they're all simple procedures. Once we get into spinal cord stimulation, that is a little bit complicated. It's still an outpatient procedure, but when with the trial, we monitor them for five, six days. When we put the permanent one, it is a surgical procedure. They, they are down, but they are still all outpatient procedures. So these are the nerve blocks I was just showing you. Just look at it. We put the needles here, and this is in the neck. We put the needles and inject the medication. So immediate relief, that is how you diagnose the, that it is helping. So we have to note down the, how their pain was before and after the injection. So Dr. Manchikanti, when you say it's a nerve block, you're doing something to the nerve that in a way stops the signal to the brain so you don't feel the pain. Is that how, what we're talking about when we're talking about nerve blocks? Yes, that is correct. We inject medication over the nerve Okay. And that blocks, not into the nerve though, that will be dangerous. So just over the nerve. These are different types of epidural injections. This is called caudal, just go above the tailbone. This is called interlaminar, we go in the middle of the back. And this is called transforaminal, we go from the side. So th these are all different types of epidurals. And this is in the neck. 
this is the inj putting the needle and this is the contrast how the medicine is spreading so we not only watch where we are but we watch how it is spreading this thing is epidural adhesiolysis we do this in patients who don't respond to other treatments or who have had spinal stenosis or previous surgery they develop a lot of scar tissue here if you see that we injected the contrast there is no filling here that means this person has scar tissue so we put the catheter look at this small thing that is the catheter and get it here and after that many we have to do it multiple times and then we inject the contrast look at how nerve roots are filling so that we remove that obstruction and medicine goes there and it helps so if a regular epidural didn't help this will help so this is the fusion surgery patient had all this expensive fusion but still was having problems so we do the adhesiolysis same thing now we come to the spinal cord stimulation this is how we put the two leads in here when we put for the trial it is similar to epidural but it's a lot more involved and we thread them into thoracic spine area the mid back these are the leads and when you put the permanent one we put the leads here in the mid back and we connect with the extension wire and we put a pulse generator this is a battery usually it lasts about 5 years or so so there are three parts to spinal cord stimulation and you can control this with a remote control and now they are so advanced you can program yours with a cell phone this is the intrathecal drug delivery system this is called pain pumps that is called pain stimulator or pain pacemaker and this one is pain pump here we put a catheter into the spine and connect into the reservoir where we put the medicine this needs to be filled every 2 months so it takes really really small dose like imagine if you are taking 100 mg of morphine the same effect you will get with 1 mg of morphine when you are giving into the intrathecal space is that right so your side effects are much less with it so it's less medication when you get an, uh, a pain pump uh, installed. Yes, like one hundredth of, of the medication. Okay. So. And if you have vertebral compression fractures, there are treatments called balloon kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. And finally, we want to talk a little bit about the medicines. So there are lots of medicines you all know. Everybody knows about the medicines. These are NSAIDs. That is the ibuprofen and so on so forth and tylenol also falls into that group opioids pain medications anti convulsants these are like neurontin lyrica anti depressants these medicines are not just for depression they help you to sleep they increase your energy and they also help the pain sometimes we also use corticosteroids these are anti inflammatory drugs so everything has a price to pay If you take too much Tylenol, it hurts your liver. If you take uh, too many NSAIDs, it hurts your kidney and heart. And anti-epileptic drugs they cause you sedation and interaction with other drugs. Benzodiazepines. These are one of the famous drugs in olden days. Uh, like Randy, you were talking to me about that movie on OxyContin. Yes. The same family developed the diazepam originally. diazepam xanax valium ativan so these are used for anxiety but the death rate when you combine with opioids is very high so now the benzodiazepine use is much less a doctor won't give both of them together so they have to go to a psychiatrist to get these drugs now it is they cause drowsiness dizziness lightheadedness confusion many more problems memory issues the most important one is the opioids i everyone is concerned about opioids we always question why doesn't my doctor won't give me enough pain medicine why do i need this thing all these other things opioids are good pain medications but at the same time they also have a lot of issues first you develop tolerance that means you need to take more medicine just to get the same effect that essentially means you are also dependent on it they also have many central nervous system side effects immunosuppression 
they also interact with other drugs. So moderate doses are critical. So low doses, moderate doses are critical. We use a lot of opioids in the United States more than any other country. But the problem created was different now. CDC, I'm sure everybody heard of CDC recently. So they described three waves of rise in opioid overdose deaths. I modified it into four waves. So wave one was we were giving too many prescriptions. That started in 1990 or earlier. Then wave two was heroin came into picture and started doing that, increasing. The prescription drugs really didn't increase that much. It, they just stayed pr pretty much the same. Now they are down. 2013 started the synthetic opioid, that is the fentanyl. And then the one I'm creating is the wave four. This is because of the synthetic opioids. But how did we get to the synthetic opioids? Because of many guidelines developed and we can't do what we want to do and patients are not able to get these appropriate treatments. Not only the opioids, but even other treatments. So people are forced to go to street and get other opioids and they die sometimes. So opioid deaths are increasing, but those are not because of the prescription opioids. They are because of the other ones. Overall prescriptions are down significantly. So what we do is we try to provide compassionate opioid therapy at our centers. We, if you are positive for, let us say, if you are doing well, it's fine. We just Test, test your urine and go on with it and we treat other t issues too with other treatments. But if you test positive for an illicit drug, we give you ch chances here. Some places they just discharge you. We don't do that. We continue to the therapy. We keep repeating the tests. We start using, reducing the dosages. Initially, we don't do anything. Norm if you're normal two times, you're fine. If you're not normal, then we have to reduce the start reducing the dosages. The same thing happens if you are abnormal again, then you will be discharged or we withdraw from the care. If it's complex abnormal, you are major issues, then we will go ahead and discharge you or withdraw the care. So that is pretty simple. And if you follow the rules, we follow the rules, and we have to work in a cooperative manner. But remember, there are interventional techniques to help you with this, and we should be focusing on other issues, other modalities of treatments other than just pain medication. So Dr. Manchikante, I wanna thank you for coming on the program, we're out of time. So Pain Management Centers of America, you have 14 locations. You have a massive team of interventional pain physicians that I guess they're all trying to avoid heavy medications and surgery. Um, they can call you directly or they can ask to get a referral to see you. You're accepting all types of insurance. Thank you, by the way, for this uh, very informative uh, interview. Thank you. You're watching the Wellness Hour News That Makes You Healthier. I'm Randy Alvarez. For now, I wish you good health.